hope you're enjoying the content from the Women in Tech conference that we're at. I am going to start, let me see. Oh, there you go. The slides are there. Very good. This is technology is working. Um, so as um, Margaret mentioned, I'm the CTO at Wayfair, and, and I hope that there are some happy customers in our um, virtual room today. So in, in talking about Wayfair and kind of how we use AI to enhance our customer experiences, I thought I'd highlight some of the tech that's under the covers, um, powering the experience that really connects our customers uh, with their desired products, right? whether they're browsing online or visiting some of our new stores that we have uh, currently in the, the Massachusetts area. And I'll talk a little bit more specifically about how we leverage data, um, data-driven insights, uh, AI, ML, learning, as well as other emerging technologies to create this really highly personalized and engaging shopping journey for every customer. So let's go and jump right in. Um, there we go. Very good. So um, the first thing I would say is, you know, in terms of Wayfair, uh, you know, hopefully you all have, hopefully many of you have actually experienced this from the site or app um, that you've shopped this before, but we're really a tech enabled digital first retailer that's focused on the home category. Uh, one of the things that's fairly unique about us is that we are a third party marketplace. So we're a platform that connects customers and suppliers who are inventory light from that perspective. Um, but, you know, because we are a two-sided platform, you know, we have the suppliers and our customers as the constituents and we leverage technology to enable these experiences, services, capabilities uh, to connect up both the customer suppliers. So think of us sort of like as a matchmaker, right? We're matching our customers' uh, desires with our suppliers' um, products and then fulfilling it. So if I go to the next slide. Um, if I think about our technologists, you know, it, it really is spanning the whole the shopping experience, the merchandising, marketing, operations, and, and supplier services, as I mentioned, customers and suppliers are on two ends of our of our of our platform. And as a tech team, our mission is really to create the capabilities to power this world-class retail experience. And um, we believe that we have a, a unique customer proposition. Um, you know, the home category has some really unique challenges. And our singular focus, because we are singularly focused on just the home category, it gives us the opportunity to really make sizable investments from a technology org perspective to build out these um, bespoke solutions that give us this strong competitive advantage. And in particular, we've been leaning into machine learning and other capabilities that allow us to have this um, advantage. So I will now talk you through, so some of, in terms of what we've done with machine learning, you know, as it turns out, there's a lot of tech um, and ML that is required to power this matchmaking that I that I mentioned before. Um, so to that end, we've made some pretty sizable investments. And uh, I thought what would, might be useful is to share a little bit about the framework that we use to figure out um, when and what areas to apply ML to. So if you think about where we start first, I'm sure it's no surprise, right? Our top consideration is the availability, accessibility, and quantity of data as well as the quality and the relevance of data, right? So that really is sort of the building blocks uh, for which we, we then apply uh, sort of the machine learning uh, models on top of. The second consideration is one that I'll spend, so assuming that that's table stakes and we have that, the second consideration I'll spend a little bit more time on today is to look for how we um, look for problems with what we call tolerance for some inherent uncertainty. So we find that tasks with more tolerance for forgiveness or faulty predictions and that have a clear path for iteration and improvement through feedback loops, those are perfect for machine learning, right? So then what, um, practically speaking, right? In our world, some of these examples are things like keyword bidding. So if you think about um, us advertising or, or doing our marketing, that's one of the areas where we would uh, be able to do more sort of machine learning automation. Um, search and personalization are other two candidates, uh, I would say that, that work well from this automation perspective, both because they have the volume and the relevant data to um, to power machine learning, but also because you know back to the inherent noise around the predictions. I mean, the 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 main thing about that is that the noise is tolerable, right? So, so just as a, a practical example, if we're on search and a customer is searching for a blue sofa, blue sofa, we use our ML models. We rank you know n number of sofas, and number five, the fifth ranked sofa is the one that the customer ends up picking. And so that's great. So you could say, you know, um, it's great. The the customer picked the sofa. Maybe, you know, you say, hey, look, if our ranking was was completely awesome, maybe that would have been that would have shown up in 
position number one, but the fact that it was number five and we still got the desired result. And so that's the part around we can handle some of the, the, the noise or potentially, you know, you can say, quote unquote, faulty um, prediction on that side. So that's kind of how we would kind of, as we look at things that we can leverage machine learning and, and automation for, we look for problems like that where we can handle this. Um, if I go to the next slide, this is, the next slide really just talks about that in, in more detail. I don't know if we need to go through that anymore, but basically, you know, full versus partial driving automation is another example of sort of how much how much tolerance do you have, right? When you have partial and there's human in loop, you, you know, you can do a little bit more. Full requires, uh, you know, is, is a much, much higher barrier of entry. Um, I'm actually just going to pop through some of these potentially uh, just for interest of time um, or maybe... Yeah, so, so basically, again, looking at uh, machine learning maturity, you know, as, as I mentioned, we, we really think about applications. We started out where a lot of machine learning that we, we, we first sort of pioneered was really in the marketing space. Um, mentioned again that, you know, it's keyword, keyword bidding is another one where, you know, if we make a mistake, we may end up paying a little bit more for the for the keyword bid, but it's not it's not, you know, it's it's not a big deal from that perspective, right? So those are some of the areas where we've spent the most amount of time, and I would say uh, machine learning models are most mature. And then we look at other areas that we're we're investing in uh, moving forward. So I'll talk a little bit about that in the upcoming slides. So um, we are gonna uh, let me take you through a few more examples that are sort of more practical. Again, with the with with how you might have experienced the Wayfair site. And talk about you know how we are enhancing the experience using um, ML and technology. Okay, so I mentioned early on a little bit uh, before too that shopping for home online is is different than for other categories. And and I would say you know having been at a company too where I've sold every tried to sell everything to everybody, um, the home category has always been the the most challenging. Part you know mostly because you know, we're dealing with largely unbranded. Um, items, right? And our category is also very highly personalized, highly emotive, and, and style-based. So there's a few unique challenges, I think, uh, for the home category. The first is, you know, understanding what our customers mean when sometimes um, they themselves may not know, let alone be able to express it. So even in this example, if you look at that green couch, right? So we might say it's a green couch, but if you want to be very specific and precise, it's actually um, a Chesterfield-style sofa that is probably velvet of velour and in teal or something like that, right? So now, how often is a customer going to be able to provide that much detail? It's actually not that often, right? So a lot of times you might get green couch, and so it's not precise. It's not like saying that, hey, you know, I'm shopping for a pack of six-pack of AAA batteries, right? So it's, it's a lot more nuanced. So understanding the customer is, is one of our, our big challenges. The other... Um, sort of the other side of it is how do you present products, right, to the customers? And so creating and presenting products in a way that's consistent across a very, very large catalog and a very diverse supply base and making it easy to search and browse um, and match up our customers to our products. That's that's the second, I would say, big challenge for us. Um, and again, remember that this is a highly sort of pretty much an unbranded category. So that makes it uh, especially difficult. And then the third part is uh, around the supply chain, right, and fulfilling it. So much of what we sell and ship are very large, very bulky items. Um, and so, you know, and they're sold around the world, right? So shipping and receiving requires a lot of um, forecasting, planning, and, and space, frankly, to store and transport. And then obviously just getting it to the customers um, in a timely way, you know, without damage, et cetera, is one of the challenges that we have. So how do we... Um, apply, you know, ML and technology to sort of one, the, the first of the three challenges in terms of understanding our customers. As I mentioned, um, it's hard to understand what our customers mean uh, when when they're when they're trying to browse and, and search for items on our site. They might use subjective language, right? It may be soft, warm, comfortable, but they they still want to make sure that they would still like to get good results, right? So there's a little bit there's there's little information. It might be fuzzy, and what makes the search and browse problem really dif difficult and different for home goods is that, you know, when you when you come to Wayfair, you may come with a functional need or you have a vague sense of style, um, but you need help to, to work it through through the shopping experience. So we have to sort of optimize our search and browse um, accordingly. So you've, we've done some work to transform our search from a lexical search, meaning 
when you look for a red sofa, we're going to show you everything that matches red sofa to something which is more semantic, right? So you look for red sofa, we'll also show you a burgundy couch, you know, maybe uh, maybe similar to the one that, that's in the picture, right? Um, so what we found is it actually yields a lot better results for our customers, especially in the category that we're in. I think that's that's uh, one of the things that's very nuanced and, and somewhat unique about our category. So to that end, we've invested very heavily in browse filters, right? So a lot of this is around the data that we have um, about our products, about our customers, and understanding also the intent of our customers, right? So we think about um, somebody who is searching for a red sofa, but we know what they've been looking at before, right? So I can understand that based on the clicks and the past purchases, interests, favorites, et cetera, I might know about this customer that they are really um, interested in, say, a mid-century modern style. So I can actually tailor the results based on that, even if it's not actually, you know, specifically mentioned in the search. So, so that's where a lot of the machine learning comes in. Um, and again, particularly helpful because of the category that we're in. Um, and also the, the second thing which I'll talk about is the is the catalog, right? So how do we create, on the other hand, when, when we're looking at products, when our customers are looking and browsing our, our catalog, how do you ensure that we create this really consistent catalog with very deep product understanding? Um, and, and how do we, if you think about this, how do we define a high quality catalog at Wayfair, right? So we want to, we want to make sure we've got really accurate and complete product information um, that enables us to respond, right, to explicit customer needs. We want to make sure that we can have good filters in search, and we want to make sure implicit customer needs are, are, are met through personalization, sort, and fulfillment. So historically, what that meant is that we, we, we tried to rely on getting all the product information we could from suppliers. Um, but again, this is a very, very diverse uh, supplier set. We don't have really standard things, uh, standard definitions uh, in, in the world that in the home category space. And so you're, you're very dependent on a very diverse set of suppliers and therefore very divergent um, information that you get back. So the success for us here was really to be able to use machine learning to enable a lot of the rich and accurate product information to ensure customers are satisfied and, and minimizing the burden that we put on our suppliers. Right. So we want to make sure that we can allow customers to easily find what they're looking for. Um, and so we use machine learning to take in whatever information we can from our suppliers and then we augment and enrich um, and pull out the required information, even if they've not exactly specified it. We use also a lot of um, ML on the image recognition space as well to be able to glean a lot of that um, information out. So. If we do that well, um, and hopefully, uh, you know, if you've shopped outside, hopefully you can find that hey, look, there's good dimensional data. There's um, that, that you're able to trust that what you what you were shopping for and what you got is kind of what you what you what you intended. And this is a fundamental, you know, for us in our category, and fundamental piece of our success, right? Because of the specific nuances of buying bulky, expensive, um, you know, aesthetically pleasing products, we want to make sure that we do this match. We can we can show you the information as well as possible. We do this match based on what you, you're you looking for and, and that it's successful. Because it's, again, it's 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 expensive for us to, to ship it back, et cetera, right? So returns are, um, are expensive. So we want to make sure that we have the best chance possible of this being um, a successful match. Um, and then finally, I, I might talk about, this is um, GeoSort is, uh, is a capability that we launched uh, not too long ago, but basically it allows us to optimize and again, using everything that we built up. So we talked about machine learning and how we built up our customer understanding. We, we built up the product understanding um, and, and understanding, hey, look, this this green couch is, is very, very similar to another green couch, et cetera. So we're using sort of all the building blocks that we have um, around machine learning. And what GeoSort then does is it, it sort of sits on top of that, right? And so what it says is that we've got fulfillment centers across the country how do I make sure that I can position a product in a fulfillment center based on demand, uh, close to the customer based on demand, right? And then once I have that, how do I then boost products that that um, that are near the customers, right? Uh, located close to customers, higher in the sort order. Um, and in, in some cases, you might provide, again, un because we do understand the product information really well, we can provide substitution for products that are further away, right? So you can say back to the this green couch and another green couch are similar enough. Uh, we might show you the one that is close to you higher up in the, in the sort. And so what this allows us to do is to really tailor um, the, the experience for the customer and really 
provide a, an experience, hopefully that's a win-win for the customer suppliers and for us, right? Because the customers are going to be able to find um, products that they like that are closer to them, that's going to be able to be shipped and, uh, and, and received a lot faster. Suppliers, you know, from, from, from that perspective, you know, easier to get the customers and they get the sale. And in, in our case too, right, just the, the whole um, cost of shipping and fulfillment is, is also reduced, uh, damage is also reduced if we do this well. So something that's powered, like I said, uh, by machine learning across sort of foundational capabilities and then additional uh, technology that we layer on top of that. Um, and then I, I don't know if uh, many of you have experienced, but we actually opened up some stores. Uh, I guess it was last year. We have three stores now. Um, we have them in mostly Massachusetts. There's uh, two all modern stores and another a Justin Main store in Burlington, Massachusetts. And so if I think about the, um, you know, I want to talk to you a little bit about the sort of some, I wouldn't say it's completely unique, but it's a little bit different, right? Shifting from a very digitally native online retailer to also our in-store presence. And so being e-com first, what does that mean, right? Um, and, and as we transition primarily from this online shopping journey to incorporating these in-store experiences, what we've done is we've tried to leverage the very similar online data and, and insights that we do. So we talked about data-driven um, insights, analytics, and machine learning. A lot of that which we've applied online, we've been able to um, use that to offer really personalized product recommendations. And also in terms of curating the displays that we have in our physical retail stores based on customer preferences and local trends that we've been able to um, collect over time. And so, um, you know, we've been able to do that. And then we've also sort of augmented, we've used technologies like augmented reality and virtual reality in store that will allow customers to visualize their products in their homes as well, right? So, so we want to make sure we can bridge the gap between offline and um, online, online and offline shopping. And for us moving from sort of digital to in-store uh, and ensuring that there's still, that the customer can transition easily between shopping online and shopping in the store. And so um, I think I have some examples and I'm trying to think time-wise how we're doing. We do it. Okay. Um, let me show you some of the examples. So um, no problem, one of, you can definitely give an example or two and then we'll we'll wrap up after that. Okay, that sounds good. So um so, th so thank you for that. Uh, so basically we mentioned we have some stores in, in Massachusetts. The main thing we wanted to do is as you walk into one of our physical stores, is for you to be able to do sort of the opposite of what as what you've done online, right? So in online we've got, you know, millions, you know. 40 some million products that we want to make sure that we can curate and display and make it really easy for you to find the thing that you're looking for. So it's like big selection to something small that's manageable. Um, in the store, we're going to kind of go the opposite way. So you go in the store and you can experience everything in the store, but it's very easy for you to also um, get to the endless aisle, which is our catalog, right? So a lot of the the technology that we have in the store should, again, be able to sort of take you from that real world um, to everything else that's available um, online. And so there's some interesting things that we do there. And then maybe just um, the last thing I would end with here is uh, we also have uh, a capability in store, which we call our design studio. And so, I don't know if you can see in the picture, but basically the way it works is, again, we've used um, a lot of the AR technology that we have uh, that, that we built specifically for our store. But basically, you'll see the cards um, you can see this card standing up. So basically what you do is you, you put them on that screen um, on the table and what you're able to see is there's a huge TV screen behind it and you can actually see those products showing up on the screen in a room and you can then move them, you can rotate them, you can you can stack them, you can see them side by side, you can move them, you can create other, other um, you can put in other cards and create a whole scene just to be able to sort of visualize all the products, any of the products that you don't actually see in the store. So again, this is the another example of how we're using sort of a lot of our AR capabilities in store to help you again bridge the gap between being the physical world and and um, and online. So I'm sorry, I know I spoke really fast. Uh, hopefully that was uh, helpful, and um, and I'll turn it back to you, Margaret. Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, as you were explaining so many pieces there, I know there were amazing technical components as far as like switching from lexical to semantic based search and different things that you did. But now all I can think of is I want to go look for a red sofa. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Fiona, for being here today.